On October 22nd, Genshin Impact's Monster Nation received its third act to conclude the somewhat mediocre story being told. Within this act, a new character was introduced toward the very end, La Signora, the first Harbinger to be introduced being the 8th of the 11 Fatui Harbingers. While irrelevant on her own, she manages to remain relevant despite her limited screen time, alongside developing the Traveler to a more than satisfying degree. She does this through reappearing at the most vital moments to each nation's storylines, being at the very end. I'll stop yapping, spoilers ahead, and this is my opinion. Let's go. <laughs> At last, Mondstadt's rodent ruler in the flesh. <laughs> Scurrying through the streets, looking for leftovers. I want to mention I'm primarily speaking on her use within the game storyline, rather than anything related to her backstory. I may occasionally bring it up in order to complement her general writing, but overall, I'm prioritizing the in-game content and how she's written in a unique yet effective way. I might even compare her to Alakina at the end, as I feel they may be somewhat similar by the end of the storyline. That's the gist of it all, so let's get into it. If you're looking for a proper lore-based character analysis, this is not the place. I do like psychology, but that's watching, not making. In Mondstadt, Signora is irrelevant within the proper in-game story, though a singular scene that goes for around 2-3 minutes is incredibly effective as an introduction. It does three main things that are built upon during each other nation, however. In this section, I'll run through it. She builds upon the Traveler for Tui, and on top of that, herself. Firstly, the Traveler. During Mondstadt's runtime, the Traveler is praised as the honorary knight doing good deeds and achieving admirable things, all while being effectively a stranger to both the nation and the world itself. There's effectively no humbling, and it feels like a stereotypical isekai where the main character is incredibly powerful for, like, no good reason. It's especially present here, as Genshin is seen as a husk of a game focused around gacha and anime tropes. This is pretty clear with how Mondstadt's storyline is handled, being incredibly basic in my opinion. It's similar to Doki Doki Literature Club, where the game begins contradictory to its genuine nature. Genshin starts all anime, stereotypically cute and innocent, but becomes more cold within the reality upon Signora's introduction. I'll explain it more now. After it feels like everything's happened and the silly little conclusion with Barbara's damn near heart attack takes place, the first of many Fatui Harbingers shows herself, La Signora. She snaps us out of both the celebration and breaks the illusion of what Genshin Impact seemed like on the surface. Just think about it. The Traveler befriended everybody, defeated the Valen, defeated Abyss Mages, ruined guards, eyes of the storm, and the Fatui seemed incredibly irrelevant being, at face value, two diplomats from Snezhnaya applying pressure on the Jean, the Grand Master of the Knights of Favonius. All of a sudden, La Signora breaks all of it. The Fatui? They're relevant as we question who the rest of the Harbingers are. I mean, it says Eleven for a reason. There's suddenly a highly powerful fray of characters that aren't even the Ar- oh my god. There's suddenly a highly powerful fray of characters that aren't the Archons, and only the eighth one was required to already beat down Fancy, the Animo Archon, and you, the Traveler. It creates a strong impression of power from the Fatui, and it shows that there's more to the world than what's on the surface. It's easy to then assume that they're the main antagonists, but each nation still manages to switch it up, whether it's through the Abyss or exclusive casts of villains. That's irrelevant though. My point is, La Signora easily humbles the Traveler and properly introduces the Fatui, doing them justice, which by extension all serves to break the classic Isekai illusion. She also shows off a few elements of them in general, just by showing that shared disdain for Vensi that the Cryo Archon also has. Finally, it shows who she is as well. And while I'm not particularly interested in her backstory, it's a unique way of storytelling as her actions are further explained in artifacts, such as her kicking Venti was due to his abandonment of the nation, resulting in Signora's lover dying during the Cataclysm. A basic rundown of the story is that she was born in Mondstadt, and not long after falling deeply in love with the Knight of Favonius, she went to the Academia in Sumeru to study, even having a liquid timepiece gifted to her by him that would count down till they'd see each other once again. When she came back, he was deceased due to the Cataclysm as I stated, and she grieved so hard that she sat sacrificed her immortal body in order to become Liquid Flame. Eventually, she was recruited into the Fatui Harbingers and cooled down to result in who we see now, La Signora. She harbors no delusion nor vision, simply being a product of, well, everything messed up in the world. A being of pure terror, which perfectly fits her ability to sour the reality of Tevat during Mondstadt's third act in my opinion. It makes her feel otherwise unique to me, and of course, that's… there's more to be discussed once we move to her next appearance, Liyue. Not bad. Your swordsmanship is quite impressive. But that's about as far as you'll get. 
This one is, despite my initial expectations, probably the most minimal when it comes to talking. In terms of face value content, Signora does technically have more screen time here, but it does still do her justice beyond simply giving us more content to work with. To put it as basic as possible, she's the first real recurring character from Mondstadt's Archon quests, and really the only one. The only other thing connecting this is the actual inclusion of Fatui Harbingers to begin with, so this is appreciated in my opinion. Let's really consider this. She has a very important role in an indirect manner, planning out over 50% of the main events unfolding in Act 1 to 3, which shows how important she is. Leo is like a web of lies, deception, and altering perspectives, but I'd argue La Signora knew most out of anybody. She is a powerful figure within the world of Tavat, well, at least from our perspective up until Inazuma, though we won't be getting into that yet for, well, very obvious reasons. Let's be honest, that isn't the type of stuff I'd particularly want to bring up yet. My point is here that Leo paired with Mondstadt continues to paint her as a powerful force to be reckoned with, which also hypes up the player for future Fatui Harbingers, existing ones, her as a character, and more. It builds on everything that's been established previously, and even goes to extend upon her backstory's influence. What happens here once again serves as a plot twist, just not in a way you'd immediately notice nor expect. What I'm referring to is her behaviour with Zhongli when compared to Venti. Not only does it separate the two nations beyond how the Archons act, but goes to show that there is clearly something personal going on between Signora and Venti, if it wasn't already obvious enough when looking at their dialogue within the first cutscene. The fact she treats Zhongli with respect, and eventually even Raiden while treating Venti with such disregard shows this, and I like how it hints at her backstory. She also creates expectations and definitely helps with the existence of another iconic character within the Liyue arc, Tartalia or Child. This is the second Fatui Harbinger introduced, and when his introduction is mere minutes after Signora's, assuming you binge these damn quests, it's easy to assume there's a cause and effect here. Of course she's introduced to do everything I discussed in the previous section of the video, but on top of that, it's vital to Liyue's story as Child, the other Harbinger, is incredibly important to Liyue. Signora's existence as an antagonistic Harbinger single-handedly creates interest with deeply rooted expectation through simple relation, as we most likely expect the same from Stejnaya's greatest love machine. However, over the course of the first two acts, despite its slice of life nature, helps us grow to trust Child, only for that message of the Fatui's antagonism to bite us back once he quote unquote betrays us. It isn't exactly a lie of any sorts, but well, it's interesting. I like how once Signora's role is reinforced in Child, we then literally see her as the one behind the scenes of it all. She doesn't even get along with the guy, only serving to make her feel more alienated from the known world at the time. She is unique, even in the realm of body models, don't forget. The Traveller also experiences more development, as he goes from being beat down by Signora to being on at least close to equal footing with her, only because of the presence of a second Fatui Harbinger. You could consider Child being the real case of development here, but with no Signora in Mondstadt vs Liyue, there's no comparison, and therefore no real straightforward development. I appreciate her inclusion within the arc of the story is my point. She's iconic, if you play the story. Like she is the harbinger during the classic Genshin gameplay, which to me is everything before the chasm, and then Child takes that role after. However, Signora, much like her body, isn't really there as a person, and more of a lingering theme or tool within the story. She's only liquid flame, she's only physical pain, and she's only a device for the game. Nothing about her is organic, including her departure in the next nation. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Inazuma, arguably one of, if not the worst nation storylines in the game. It's directly offensive to players and even offensive to Signora. I don't find it exactly bad, just more like they could have done it far better. I'll run through the events from an analytical point of view first, however, as I can't discuss this all without you at least knowing of the proper source material. Before getting to the endgame Signora content, which isn't as in-game as you'd expect, let's talk about something else Fatui related, the sixth of the Fatui Harbingers, Scatamouche. Scatamouche is affected similarly to Child, as we assume the worst from a Harbinger. However, unlike Child, it's immediately lived up to, although not so much if you meet him during his actual debut. Scatamouche is assumed to be evil by both the Traveller and Player, and pleasantly enough is. He's making delusions and denies none of it, fully agreeing with and even deriving pleasure from the suffering of humankind. You could technically consider his appearance within Inazuma as another form of teasing his backstory, but at least they tell it properly, unlike Signora over here who gets done dirty not only in general, but specifically in this part of the story. The midget puppet also leaves a bit of taste in your mouth, whether it's overall or strictly towards the Fatui is irrelevant. My point is, Signora just happens to appear not long after this, taking advantage of that bitterness to help emphasize and improve the scenes where you fight her. Her scene begins 
with it, however. It doesn't remain as such, as her typically condescending bitterness both here and in previous nations slowly transitions to a more condescending, genuine anger, much like Child in the third phase of his boss fight. I brought this up in my video on Alakino, but Harbingers have a criteria, and this scene here effectively concludes the Fatui Harbinger bingo that we've all been waiting for. Also confirming that this should be expected for ones in the future of the main story. Unfortunately for her, just as she does all this, she gets killed off by the Electro Archon. <laughs> It perfectly foils what happens in Mondstadt, honestly, and it really helps develop the storyline in The Traveller, alongside finally putting her sweet, sweet anger to rest. She goes from kicking Venti as the Traveller fails to protect him to the Raiden Shogun, eliminating her after the Traveller manages to defeat her, fully changing up what happened in the First Nation. Signora's existence is a beautifully intertwined story of three acts, with the third being both the climax and the conclusion. It parallels the first three nation storyline structures, funnily enough being the only one so far to include Signora herself. I think there's some intention to it, and while I don't particularly like how she was handled in Inazuma, or really Inazuma in general, I think it was well done. Just not to my subjective tastes. I never really cared for her to begin with anyway. If I had to be honest, I just like her on an objective level. I believe the fight is well done, as it finally shows her Molten Flame side, alongside just overall showing her abilities on a comprehensive, cohesive level. It hasn't happened before, and Signora has always been talked up throughout the storyline. Though in pure honesty, a big part in her unique nature is just the fact she dies. <laughs> I think that's pretty clear. Nobody else dies throughout the game. Well, at least not important characters that look like they could be playable down the line. I think I got my point across, so I want to discuss an important theory or two that could come true, just to end off the video in a way with food for thought. I am a Snezhnayan diplomat. You know what happens if you lay a finger on me. I swear, if you strike me, I will make sure... The Fatui will make sure that your precious Inazuma... Stop! I order you! And you... Filthy rats! All of you! I'll start this off with a bold statement. I called out Lakino pointless in my last video, and while I don't exactly disagree with what I said, I will admit there is a possibility in which she gets her somewhat satisfactory development, while also letting the future Harbingers be developed to, once again, satisfying degrees. This all of course involves Signora. It isn't just some random attempt at justification for my older video because criticism hurts. A tiny bit. Anyway, I'll stop yapping, let's move on. I see Signora as the main point of progression of the first half of the storyline, being present throughout Mondstadt, Liyue, and Inazuma. However, Sumeru was the middle point, allowing her to not be relevant as she was eliminated within the nation prior. Starting in Fontaine, which should theoretically be the beginning of the second half, Arlecchino was introduced in a rather vague and uninteresting way, being utterly pointless to Fontaine's Archon quests, like I said. You could argue Signora was the same, and both Harbingers alongside nations are remarkably similar, so perhaps Alakino could be the Signora of the next three nations, foiling her throughout each finale arc or so. It could be incredibly different in handling, only sharing the quirk of existing within three consecutive nations. I just think it's interesting to think about, and would both justify and give more purpose to Alakino as a character who is incredibly loved within the fanbase, I know because of my torch fire YouTube comments. On the contrary, it's also less likely considering she's most likely becoming playable in either version 4.6 or 4.7, which gets in the way a decent bit. Signora never became playable, let alone within the first three nations she's shown the be within, so it just feels slightly odd that they're handling her this way in the perspective of my theory. Whether or not they're planning to do so, I think it would be quite a nice idea. Let's try talking about Signora more directly, shall we? I believe she'll come back in that land, as ballsy and bold as it might sound initially. Let me explain my somewhat cohesive justification for such an offensive thought process. You could also just call it some level of copium, but it's not like I love her. She just deserves a bit more fleshing out in my opinion. Natlan in the Travail teaser trailer is referred to as the incandescent ode of resurrection, which to me hints towards that possibility. Firstly, the most obvious fact from the name, Resurrection. Of course, it would make perfect sense for some character exclusive to the nation to be deceased for the storyline, but if we think from a different angle, Signora is the only dead important character, excluding Greater Lord Ruka Devada and Fosalors, which could easily help us connect the dots. However, there's more to the name. 
Incandescent means either emitting light upon being heated or full of strong emotion, passionate. Both of these fit Signora as we see in her death scene, the crimson witch of Ember's side of her lighting up upon her being heated, and her strong passionate emotion as she calls everybody filthy rats. It's possible this emotion and heat will be carried along to Natlan as it is the Fire Nation, and the only other notable mention of anything Crimson is the Crimson of Gates, Ors and More, within Dragonspine, which is all about resurrection, abyssal power, and Durin. It just seems too perfect in my opinion. There's an ode there. Signora threatens Raiden before dying, saying the Fatui will ruin her precious Inazuma. This is a little bit of a stretch, but I'm throwing in every egg I have into this basket, so naturally I'll explain myself as best I can. Just her being dead and not having a proper mortal body instead of having something made of liquid flame makes me believe she'll be relevant to Natlan, and I find it difficult to think otherwise. That's really all though. I'm done, very tired, and these theories are… questionable. Let's move on to the conclusion now. Signora you video in over. Coffin, encased in layer upon layer of ice. Yeah, but Rosaline, I promise you, your final resting place will be the entirety of the old world. La Signora is incredibly unique. I got sidetracked a lot as this is a lot more general than you might expect, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. She's unique as a harbinger, as a dead person, and even her design is unique. She has an insane transformation within a boss fight, and she just feels different. She only exists for the story to be fair, and I don't exactly and I don't expect her to become playable anytime soon for obvious reasons. Bye everyone, and remember, like, subscribe, join the membership, and follow my Instagram at its.big.tt.